There's a reason we avoid the truth with our sociable lies and our psychological blocks, which is it's usually too hard to bear. Kafka said, a book must be the ax for the frozen sea within us. John Ruskin, the greatest art critic of the 19th century, as well as one of its greatest social critics, a personal hero of mine, a crucial influence on Proust, Gandhi, and many others, put the matter this way. The more I think of it, I find this conclusion more oppressed upon me. That the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. And, and, and if you think that he meant this in a metaphorical sense, you're getting him precisely wrong. He means literally seeing. Our eyes slide over the world as we obsess about our grades or our sex life or our income. Our minds slide over it. Art, to paraphrase the poet Shelley, bursts the spirit's sleep. Now, to say that the humanities can be a path to truth is itself to challenge one of the most closely held beliefs of our time. We live not only in a scientific world, but also in a scientistic one, a world that thinks that science, empirical, objective, quantifiable, is the exclusive form of knowledge, and that other modes of inquiry are valid only insofar as they approximate its methods. But the humanities and science face in opposite directions. They don't just work in different ways, they look at different things. To borrow a term from Stephen Jay Gould, who was certainly one scientist who did understand the value of the arts, science and the humanities are non-overlapping magisteria. He uses that phrase, that impressive phrase, to describe the difference between science and religion, but it's a history of science and art. Non-overlapping magisteria, different forms of teaching that are each appropriate to their own domain. Scientific knowledge relates to external reality, to that which lies outside our minds and makes itself available, makes itself available for objective observation. Humanistic knowledge, relates to our experience of the world, to what reality feels like. The painter renders the subjective experience of sight, including, especially in modern art, the dreams or dreads that we project on what we see. The novelist seeks to give us the taste of what it's like to be alive at a particular moment. Um, I once told my brother, the doctor, that as a literary critic, I was interested in questions of time and space. And he looked at me as if I had said that, as a literary critic, I was interested in performing brain surgery. <laughs> um, but the time and space I meant were not the physicists. They were the experience of space and time as represented by the novelist. And you can think of uh, time in Proust or space in Dickens. The scientist seeks to be objective and appeals to the impersonal language of numbers. The artist speaks from individual experience and appeals to our individual experience. Humanistic knowledge isn't verifiable or quantifiable or reproducible. It can't be expressed in terms of equations or general laws. It changes from culture to culture and indeed from person to person. It's a matter not of calculation, but interpretation. When we engage in humanistic inquiry or in plainer language, when we think about a poem or a sculpture or a piece of music, we ask not how big is it or how hot is it or what does it consist of, but what does it mean? We ask of a scientific proposition, is it true? But of a proposition in the humanities, we ask, is it true for me? Is it true for me? Does it make sense not to me, but of me? The highest function of art, and of literature in particular, is to bring us to that knowledge of ourselves that college ought to start to give us. The ultimate reason to read the classic authors, Mark Edmondson says, is to see if they may know you better than you know yourself. I, uh, I heard from a psychiatrist who uses literature as a tool of practice. I had written a review of Tolstoy, and he wrote to me, and I actually, his letter was so interesting that I cyber-stalked him and discovered that he was, in fact, a psychiatrist. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, this was so interesting. Do you ever do, you ever do this? And, and, and he wrote another very interesting email. In, that said, among other things, I recently terminated a six-year course of treatment with a man who was initially referred because he'd become addicted to narcotics. He was a deeply depressed, inhibited, bitter, and unfulfilled person. I suggested that he read D.H. Lawrence, and in this case, a rare exception, he took me up on the offer, the challenge, really, and for most of his treatment, Lawrence was our constant companion. When I was a kid, people found themselves in literature. I found myself for the first time when I was 14 in The Catcher in the Rye, no more. But this man would come in and read to me from Lawrence and say, that's me. 
that's me. That is the essential experience of art. We see ourselves in the other and the other in ourselves. Freud speaks of the uncanny, by which he means something that is both strange and familiar at once, strangely familiar. So it is with the revelations of art. Art brings us home by taking us abroad. We read of Hamlet or Jane Eyre, and across the differences of time and place, with a pang of guilt and bliss, we see our nature mirrored up to us, but seen as if anew. Find yourself is perfect, that phrase. You're, you're reading about medieval Denmark, which is this very strange world of courtiers and princes, and all uh, uh, at once, as if in a dream, you somehow find yourself among them. Art gives names to experience. We recognize Antigone or the wife of Bath or Madame Bovary as permanent human types, as well as permanent potentialities within ourselves. We can think of the role that literary characters have played, Ahab, Huck Finn, Gatsby, Holden, in articulating the American consciousness. But art also gives you models for experience, especially when you're young. You find in Elizabeth Bennett or Stephen Dedalus an image of the person that you want to be. Books are maps of possible futures. Reading, Edmondson says, is life's grand second chance. Art does not make you a better person. It only makes you a freer one. 